This is Understanding the Kingdom, Part 50, uh, entitled A Biblical Look at the Gift of Tongues. This week has been a transitional week. In the weeks and months to come, you're going to be seeing a lot of change with Biblical Life TV. Uh, God has opened the door with Life Streams Media uh, that we're going to be going on their system that will be both, uh, that will be on, that they'll have streaming channels on internet, on Roku, and eventually on satellite TV. And so that we're going to be, uh, there's going to be some changes to include, uh, I'm going to have to restrict myself to 50 minutes when I teach, then divide that up into two episodes so that we can meet the industry standard of 28 minutes, 30 seconds per show that goes out. But God is opening doors. We're excited about it, and it's, it's, it's because of the blessing of God. It's because of the prayers and the support of our partners in ministry that God is opening this. And we're grateful, and we give glory to God for it. We're going back today to Acts chapter 2, and we're going to be dealing a lot of issues with tongues and trying to bring things back into biblical balance. I personally believe that when God, and, and you, you can see the pouring out of God's Spirit throughout church history, there's been a lot of wonderful books written on moves of God across the, the annals of time within church history, that whenever God poured out His Spirit, that tongues did manifest, but so did all the other gifts of the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that I have pondered uh, over the years is making tongues the initial gifts of the Holy Spirit, I think, is an error within a lot of Pentecostalism. There are many of the gifts, and even what we're going to see here in the book of Acts, those kind of tongues is going to connect all the way back to Mount Sinai. It's going to connect to a lot of things. That it was a sign and a wonder and a proof to Israel of the expansion of the covenant. And, I've, and over the years, I've seen a lot of people, in fact, when we get into the, some of the basic definitions of what it means to speak in tongues as we get into the writings of the Apostle Paul, we're, we're seeing those that claim to have the gift, but there's not the fruit of the gift in their lives. Everybody goes, what? Well, we'll just wait a couple of minutes. We'll, we're going to get into this. But I want to start here in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. You need to underline that in your Bible. Shavuot is one of the three feasts that every Jew, every Hebrew is required to be in Jerusalem for. So no matter where they were in the world, they came up to Jerusalem for the celebration. So you had them uh, from the known world at that time. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because every man heard them speaking, or heard them speak in their own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, uh, saying to one another, Behold, are not all these which uh, speak Galileans, which meant uneducated. This carpenters and fishermen. They weren't, they weren't highly educated to where they could speak many dialects. And now we hear every man in his own tongue wherein he, uh, were, where we were born. So there's, there's several dynamics here. Now in Greek, the word tongues here is glossé. It's where we get the theological term among spirit-filled community, glossiolia. And it means a tongue, a member of the body for speech, it also means the language or dialect used by a particular people distinct from that of other nations. And so there's several things in play that we have. We have everybody coming in for Shavuot. We have the Spirit of God moving. We've already dealt some with the fire of God. When these, when these people come out and they're moving under the power of God, that they were speaking in, there's, there's several dynamics here. 
those that had, uh, uh, they had, they were speaking tongues that they had not learned. And so as, as we, we see, there's going to be some variation because a lot of times what we traditionally call speaking in tongues is not necessarily connected with this manifestation. It's a further expression of it as it begins to develop within the body that we see fully explained by the Apostle Paul in Corinth. And, and actually, I thank God that things had gotten squirrely with the, with the church of Corinth because if it had not, we may not have had such an explanation of, of the gifts of the Holy Spirit that we do have. Now, there is a connection at Mount Sinai. And one of the things that the sages of Israel have taught, and I've been able to follow this back all the way to the times before Christ. Because, you know, there's a lot of times you follow, th- when you begin looking at the sages of Israel, uh, there, is, there is a jaundice and there is a tilting of things after the rejection of Messiah that you see in, in Talmudic literature and other things that they transfer, they either dismiss it, sometimes they outright forbid the research of certain parts of Tanakh. They forbid it because they know it will lead to pointing to Jesus. And so before that, there's not this skew, there's this expectation and this honest uh, exegeting of Scripture from, from a, a rabbinical or a Hebraic mindset. And when Israel met God at Mount Sinai, you not only had Israel, but there were a lot of Gentiles that had come out, out of Egypt with them that gathered around Mount Sinai. And the rabbis believed that when the fire was on the mountain, so you have the mountain, you have rushing wind, you have fire that, that caused all of them to tremble, and God spoke to them to make covenant with them that they had taught long before Jesus had even come, that when God did this, every nation on the planet heard the call of God in their own tongue. But only Israel and the Gentiles that were gathered around that mountain yielded and became part of that covenant. So now we have the initiation of the priesthood. We dealt with that on the last session. We also have the first public demonstration of the Brit Hadashah or the expanded covenant and now no matter where they are, there, so there's, there's a connection with Mount Sinai. You have fire, and now you have every person, when the, when the people came out and they were speaking either in tongues or God just supernaturally caused the people to hear in their native tongue. Because for a lot of the Jews, their native tongue may have been Greek, it could have been Italian, it could have been a lot of different things. But their secondary language, all of them was Hebrew. When Peter came down and he gave his, he gave his discourse, after all this happened, I, I believe he did it in Hebrew because all of them would understand. But as the people came down giving glory to God for what just had happened, everybody around them heard, the, began hearing praising of, of the initial uh, giving of, this, of the Brit Hadashah, making it known to the people, and it was, in, it was in languages that all of them understood. So there's this direct connection to Mount Sinai with this. There's also a connection to the temple or the Tower of Babel. One of the things in in my research I have studied, and there's been a lot of experts try to, to, and and some etymologists try to speculate, and it's speculation that Hebrew may have been the original language. However, when you see the Apostle Paul talking in 1 Corinthians, he said, even though I speak the tongue of men and of angels, and so there's a spiritual language, and very possibly when man was, was communing with God in the garden, they spoke, he spoke the language of God. And man may have spoke the language of God all the way to the Tower of Babel. And when God confused the languages, it was not the confusion of the spirit. It was the confusion of the soul within man that caused the, the uh, not understanding and, and causing the division of languages. I remember here a couple years ago, I went up into Kansas City and, and spoke at a conference, and it was about Hebraic heritage. And when you go to those, you, it, it never ceases because I'm called to Gentiles. I'm called to bring balance to the church, whether you understand anything about Hebraic heritage, spiritual warfare, and I deal with a plethora of issues. And so I'm speaking to the average Joe, whether he's setting in America or he understands English and he's setting in New Zealand, Australia, or wherever. And so I use the name Jesus when I, when I teach and I preach. 
And I had some women have real issue with that. In fact, one of them I like to come over the top of the table at because she started saying that Jesus' name was powerless, it was nothing, and, and almost started to spit on the ground. And I found myself coming over my book table. We were about to have some real words. And, uh, and I told her, I said, listen, I've done everything but raise the dead with the name of Jesus. I've backed off demons, backed off witches. I've seen people healed. I've seen people saved. Heaven moves when I pray in that name. And many people that have this stance that you have to pray in the name of Yeshua and only use Yeshua, I have yet to meet one move in the same level of power. And I don't think it's because they're using a Jewish name. I think it's because of their heart attitude. In fact, one woman who had a master's of social work looked at her and said, the way he preaches is for me because if I'd have listened to it the way that you'd have done it, I'd have walked out of here. And so I'm contemplating all these things driving home. And I tell the Lord, you know, Lord, you know, I, I understand, you know, we, I understand the tetragrammaton can either be, be pronounced Yahweh, Yahovah, and there are several variations because Israel had lost how to pronounce that and there were no, const, uh, there were no vowels in the original Hebrew. And I said, you know, I, I have no problem with using Yeshua. And if you want me to, I'll do it. I'll, I'll do Jesus. It doesn't matter to me. And, and, you know, driving down the highway says, well, your problem is you're confused. And I said, no doubt, that's why I'm praying, you know. There, and he said, no. He said, you don't understand the dynamic of the Tower of Babel. For angels, language was not confused. For God, language was not confused. It was only confused within the soul of men. He said, how do I work the dynamic that every kindred, every tribe, every tongue will call on my name? Hmm. He said, do you see the Apostle Paul teaching all these Gentiles Hebrew so they could read the Tanakh in Hebrew, or was he preaching out of the Septuagint? I said, well, he was preaching out of the Septuagint because they all spoke Greek already. And he said, there's no record of, of the Apostle Paul in church history or the word teaching Hebrew. It may have been beneficial, but there's, there's no record of it whatsoever. And he said, on your side, there are many languages. He said, on my side, it's all Hebrew. I almost had to pull over the car. Because it dawned on me, God confused the languages within the souls of men, but the spiritual language remained true. And very possibly those that came down that were praising God may have been speaking in their spiritual language, and God unconfused it within the minds of the hearers as a sign and a wonder that the new covenant, the Brit Hadashah, was being proclaimed and empowered on that day so that we could mark it the same way that we marked when God met Moses at Mount Sinai. Does that make sense? Now, we need to set the context for the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was, was ministering to the Gentiles. And one of the things that I, I find concerning, I have a lot of people taking things out of the epistles, not even understanding the whole concept of the epistles that the Apostle Paul was writing. Whenever you read the, the have you ever seen the, the, the show game Jeopardy where they give you an answer and you've got to come up with the right question? That's kind of the way the epistles are. The Apostle Paul learned how to write epistles at the feet of Gamaliel, who was on the Sanhedrin, that whenever the local rabbis could not handle an issue, they would send a letter with a problem to the council. A lot of times it got passed over to Gamaliel. He would look at it, and he would write an epistle giving them the biblical answer to the questions that they had. The Apostle Paul learned. He, that, that's, that was his seminary professor, was Gamaliel at the school of Hillel. And so every single epistle was preceded by a problem. And the pro, one of the problems that you had in Corinth, now Corinth was, the, the, was world famous for the oracles of Delphi. And so you have these Apollyan prophets and prophetesses there. And part of the, and sometimes they would just give, give an outright prophecy. I mean, you had kings and generals and even Caesar would write to them for answers and, and would consult them before they would go to war and all these different things. 
And so it, it, was the basic, it was the basic spiritual hub of Apollyon worship and Apollyon prophecies in that area, world famous. And you, they would, part of what they would do, they would have this woman set over a sulfur pit and she would get incoherent. You know, set over a sulfur pit for how long and see how long you stay cogent, okay? And, and in this trance, she would mumble a bunch of stuff and on the side, there would be someone who give a, a prophetess or a prophet of Apollo that would give the interpretation. And so that, that is a false sign and wonder. It's an imitation of what God was going to do, but it's a counterfeit. God gives the real, but they overemphasize tongues. Because in Corinth... You were, it, it, it's like you may have been a merchant or, or poor or whatever in Corinth, but the top of the social scale in Corinth were the ones that would be setting over the sulfur pit that would speak in what would sound like tongues over the sulfur pit. They had a high level of, of respect within the community. Now you have these Gentiles coming in that are learning the Torah, they're learning about who Jesus is, and they begin manifesting tongues, and it caused pride. We've never seen that in Pentecostal circles. I speak in tongues and you don't. Looking down at the Baptist pastor. I remember when, before I was spirit-filled, you know, I've been preaching since I was 13, and people say, well, you need to get the Holy Ghost. Well, I already knew from Scripture, I got the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. He's the reason I got saved. He moved into my heart. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, as I have shared many times, is not the Holy Spirit moving within. It's the Holy Spirit coming with on for mantle for the priesthood. And sometimes they're ignorant of what Scripture really says in our terminology offends people and causes them to reject the gift of God. And so they took, they took tongues out of context. They, they took it on more than it was supposed to be, so much so that you couldn't have church, that, that you couldn't have a teaching, because you, you, if we had 100 people that wanted to take turns standing up speaking in tongues to show how they had, had ascended to a higher level socially within the community, what would get done in any service? That's what was going on with the Apostle Paul. And so he had to bring ballast. And I want to start here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 27 through 31, because he asks some very pertinent questions in, in this statement here. Starting in verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ and members in particular, and God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, the gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Underline that in your Bible. Now he asks, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues? And so there were those that did. Now in this, we don't know if he's speaking of the manifestation that people hear the translation within their own native tongue. Or if he's speaking, praying in the Spirit. And actually, when we get further into this, he actually shows there's a division between those two types of manifestation. Now, the Greek word here for diversities means race, offspring, family, stock, a nation, nationality, or descent of a, of a particular people, the aggregate of many individuals of the same nature, kind, or sort. So he's actually, in, in this sense, I believe he's talking about the manifestation like they had on the day of Pentecost. I've seen this in action. I, I have seen people go up and, and, and nobody spoke the same language. And the Holy Spirit would move on them and they would speak in what sounds like tongues. And it, to me it didn't, you know, I, I've heard enough Russian or I've heard enough Italian. You kind of, you know, you'll get bits and pieces. I didn't hear any of that. And they're responding like they're speaking fluent Italian or they're speaking fluent Latin or, you know, whatever. In fact, years ago at Azusa Street, there was the, they had the governor of California came down. I mean, God read his mail. And the first time he did it to get his attention, he, one, of the, one of the things he prided himself in in his understanding of languages is he was fluent in Latin. And because of Rome and the Catholic Church, 
Latin was always considered the, the, the tongue of the highest learned. And so you have this uneducated kid, probably didn't have over an eighth, grade, eighth or ninth grade education, stand up and begin speaking in tongues. What the governor of California is hearing is perfect high Latin. And then somebody else that he knew was, didn't, wasn't highly educated stood up and gave a perfect interpretation of the Latin. It was, I'm, that got the governor's attention. And he wanted to hear more about God. You see, it's those types, especially in an international setting, those type of things are paramount. I, I saw, uh, when I was in Germany, I saw someone walk up to a German person and really didn't know German, and, and, and this trusted guy began speaking in tongues, and the woman began to weep that she was talking to because God was prophesying and saying, you've went through some things in your life and here are the particulars of it and I, I want you to know that I love you and I want to heal you and bring restoration to you. Please accept Jesus in perfect German. Things like, especially when you end up where there, where there are diversities of nations, these things are paramount. And this is part of what he was talking about here. But he goes on in this explanation. Let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. Because there's a transition. He's speaking of diversities of ethnic groups, of, of, of nationalities. But then all of a sudden in 1 Corinthians 13, he begins to shift it. And he says, though I speak in the tongues of men and of angels. So there's a shifting that he's going to begin explaining some things that are not the manifestation, the original manifestation of the gift, but as it begins to grow and manifest fully in the body, he's showing a different dimension to this. But he adds to this, and have not love, have not charity, I have become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And so love, one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit is essential in moving in the priesthood. It is essential in moving in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. If you're not moving in love, you will contaminate the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You'll be adding your own agenda to it. I, I, over the years, I have seen men of God that began giving a prophecy that was straight from the throne of God. Yet at the end of it, it was very obvious it began to veer left because they began intertwining their own, their own desires, their own agenda, or their own ideas into a prophetic word of God. And it actually takes discipline to be a prophet because you've got to sit back and let God reveal what he wants to reveal and not add anything of your own into it. It takes a mature prophet, a mature man or woman to do that. And so he said, listen, whether you're speaking in the, in the languages, the tongues of men, how God that divided them, or the tongues of angels, which never got divided. If you don't have love, it's worthless. We need to bring back that into the church, don't we? You know, one of the reasons that I do what I do is I love the remnant wherever they are in the world. And that's why we do all the teachings we do, the podcasts we do, writing the books. It's not, it's not about making money. In fact, we own, only 5% of everything that our ministry produces do we actually ask a donation for. All the rest of it is just free, download it, enjoy it. Because the remnant are starving to death around the world. They need to hear the word of God. They need to hear it under the anointing. Because God is preparing a people for the days that are coming ahead. So it's, it's love what we do, but at the same time, how I many know you still have to keep on the lights and, and do different things too? Plus, I've not found a company yet that will print books for free. I've, I've not found anybody give me CDs for free or labels for free or toner for free. So all these things, and the post office definitely will not ship for free. Just try that sometime. It won't work. They'll say, no, there has to be a stamp. The bigger the package, the bigger the stamp, or it will not fly. And so you, you have to be reasonable about these things. In 1 Corinthians 14, 1, to, 1 and 2, he says, Now follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts. So love doesn't dismiss the gifts. Love brings balance to the gifts. 
But it has to start in love. Even when I go into this word, and I hear, here's another balance. When you go into this word, if you go into the word for love of people, you'll begin twisting the word to hear what the people want to hear, which is how God judged uh, the Levites in Malachi. Because they weren't teaching the people what they needed to hear. They were teaching them what they wanted to hear. When you go into the Word, you go into it because of your love for God. You want to hear from Him. You want His truth. You want Him to correct you. You want Him to get glory out of, out of your life as you begin to live this. And so sometimes we can get into the sloppy agape that everything is, is love and the love of people. Sheep will try to change the Word if they're unrepentant. You never change the word, the word changes you. And so my love and dedication for God as I go into this book is to not define what the people are wanting to hear, but to find what God is wanting to speak. A now word in a proper season is worth its weight in gold. He says, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. So he said, all of you are wanting to speak in tongues all the time. What you need to be doing is to move into prophecy. Now he goes on to say the type of prophecy they were moving into was for edification, exhort, and comfort. And a lot of times it'll be a simple thing like, you know, I'm with you. Have courage. Be strengthened, that, those type of things, which is different than a prophet that really shares the deep meanings of God and begins to say, you know, that this is going to happen or that's going to happen. There, there's a dichotomy here in the Word about this. But he said, listen, if you're, at least if you're all prophesying by the Spirit of God, everybody there is going to benefit from it. Rather than just all this chatter going on, nobody gets to teach the Word, nobody gets to do anything. Because, because he goes on to say, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men. So this is where there's this dichotomy. He began to, began to introduce it in 1 Corinthians 13, the tongues of angels, or the language of angels, the language of God. So when you're, when, he says, what a lot of you are doing it does not require interpretation. It does not require uh, like an interpretation like you would have an assembly, and it does not require, people are not hearing it in their own language. Therefore, it's a spiritual language. Your spirit man is praying and not your soul. You've bypassed your soul, which has the, 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 the shattering of language within it. And you're no longer speaking to men. So imagine everybody coming in and they're from different, they're different nations, and nobody speaks the same language, and they all pray to God in their language that you don't know, how are you edified? That's kind of what was happening there. But he says unto God, for no man understandeth how be it in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. And sometimes the mysteries aren't really that profound, and I've jokingly said this at conferences, and, and in times past, you know, a guy's praying, and, and he may have gotten influenced by the prosperity movement, so he can barely drive a broke-down old Pinto, and he's believing God for a Cadillac or a Mercedes because he thinks that's so. I mean, in, in, in English, he's praying, you know, God, God, give me a Mercedes, God, give me a Mercedes, and when he goes and prays in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit through him says, he doesn't need a Mercedes, just give him the money he needs to fix up his broke-down Pinto. You're speaking mysteries that maybe your own soul doesn't understand what you're talking about. So we begin, he begins dealing with being able to pray in a supernatural language, the language of the Spirit. And one of the hardest things, even for Spirit-filled people, is getting our souls out of the way so that our Spirit can speak. He goes on to say, picking up here in verse 4, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. And so there's, two, there's, there's, there's a dichotomy here. There's, when you pray in the Spirit, you're edifying yourself. And I've heard some try to say that this is derived from dunamos. It means to like build up like a dynamo. That's not the Greek word used. The Greek word used means to build a house, to erect, uh, to repair 
to establish, to found. But what I found interesting as you go down further, we have a lot of people that are praying in the Spirit, supposedly, that do not manifest because the next definition of this edifying, it produces some fruit in their lives. Listen to the fruit as manifested in this Greek word. To promote Christian growth in wisdom, affection, grace, virtue, holiness, blessedness, to grow in wisdom and piety. When was the last time you saw any of that in the charismatic church? I saw it years and years ago. That man, when somebody got baptized in the Holy Spirit and, and, their, and their prayer language was loosed, they longed for holiness. They wanted to know more about God. They wanted, they wanted the virtue of Jesus to flow through them. They had a greater hunger for the Word, a greater hunger for praise, a greater hunger for... And I think sometimes today our praise and worship does not have the effect it's supposed to have because it's all about us and we have lost sight of Him. I remember years ago, Lester Summerall, and it was when the, you know, the, the old Hosanna music, and I mean, those are really good. They're just straight out of Psalms, and, and, and there, there was no rock and roll cat fight in them or anything else. I mean, it's, there were harps and whatever in it. And a lot of the old timers didn't like it, not even realizing a lot. Some of the things that were out of our hymnal, you know, Baptist hymnal, whatever hymnal, there are some of those songs that were set to the tune of tavern songs, but we don't want to bring that up right now, okay? Uh, <laughs> uh, but they, they wanted out of the hymn and not the new ones where you had the transparencies. And so this woman got up and, and said, Thus saith the Lord, I don't like it, those, those new songs, saith the Lord, sing unto me the old songs. How many know that was she was prophesying out of her own spirit? Because if you're singing songs out of the book of Psalms, those are th- the oldest songs, okay? <laughs> they're, they're about as old as you get for those that worship, worship God. But we, that, that should have an effect upon us. There should have been edifying of us. Then he goes on to say, I would that ye all spake with tongues. And so this, def, this, this him say, I wish that ye all would He's trying to balance out in the mind of the Apostle Paul. I don't want you to dismiss it, but I realize not all of you do. My desire is that all of you would. Of the prayer language, not the manifestation of the other gift. That's diversities of tongues. I wish you all could pray out of your spirit. But he goes on, rather that you would prophesy, for greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh in tongues except he interpret that the church may be edified. You guys, there's a lot of things that are necessary in your prayer closet that aren't necessarily appropriate in church. I've screamed, I've yelled, I've danced, I've done everything but backflips because when old men do backflips and they're fat, it can be very hazardous to one's health, okay? But I've done a lot of things. I've gotten very bold sometimes, especially when I'm uh, addressing the enemy. I know that Charles Finney said that as, as, as God would move on him and he would seek revival, he said that there were times he had a boldness with God that frightened him because Finney understood the fierceness of God that our God is a consuming fire and he would get into praying and he would pray for weeks and weeks and weeks for God to bring revival. And then he said this, this, this determination of faith would rise up and he said, I would say, God, are you thankful? He said, a revival must be poured out. Heaven cannot, dare not report out revival here. And he said he'd be getting bold with God. You know, and afterwards like, I might be a grease spot after I finish. There's, there's a boldness that goes on now. Those type of things are for your prayer closet. You don't, it's not a show. You don't do it in church. And God may have you address things that maybe you don't necessarily want everybody else to know about. And so he's sharing. He said, listen, there's, there's a lot of this stuff that needs to be in your prayer closet. I've had people that said, Brother Lake, I, I, can't, you know, I, I can't speak in tongues. I, and and said, but I ha- I've had times where I've just stammered. Well, that's the beginning of it. You've been doing it for years and you don't really, because part, part of the thing that we have is the moment that we speak our spiritual language to our mind, it will sound like babble 
because that was what it was designed to do from the Tower of Babel forward. I'm going to get more on that here just in a minute. Let's go on down to verse 13 and through 15. Wherefore let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. Underline that one in your Bible. I've had a lot of men of God that entered into situations where God called them to do stuff. You know, it's, it's like right now with the opportunity that's before us, I've got to learn a lot of stuff. I'm going to have to pay for a lot of stuff being done. And I'm going to be trusting a lot on, on, on what uh, Brother Stewart is telling me from, from the media company because I don't know. You know, and, and so you're, you're, I'm going to have to trust on his expertise. And there, there has been, and how, is, how the dynamic's going to work here and balance out everything that we're doing, I don't know how it's all going to be done or what I'm going to have to change or new equipment I have to buy or all these different things. And there have been many men of God throughout history that have been faced with the same thing that didn't have a guy that they could pick up the phone and call. That they're doing something no one has done before. And what they share in their own journals is that they would pray in the Spirit for a while and then stop and say, now God, give me the interpretation. And they would be quiet before God with pen in hand so they could write it down so they wouldn't forget it. As God began to tell them what the interpretation was. And they said it was wisdom beyond themselves. They would have never have thought of putting it together that way. Many times God would tell them, you connect this person because they have a piece of the puzzle. You contact this person. This you just need to believe me because nobody's done it before, but I'll show you step by step. That's possible for those that have the fire of God. Because many of us are called to be trailblazers. You can't go and you, you can't find a book on it. You can't find, believe it or not, there are things that you cannot find YouTube videos on. I know that this whole generation may freak out over that fact, but there's things that God may call us to do. You're not going to find a mentor. The mentor is going to have to be God. And so praying in the Spirit and then asking for God to interpret is, is a vital way of getting what you need. Let me find back the scripture I was reading here. Okay, I'll, yeah, I'll be back down here. Um, for, listen, it says, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit pray. They see, it's, it's your spirit and not your soul. Okay? But my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? He's bringing balance. I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with my understanding also. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with my understanding also. But in, in reference of what he is sharing here, it's not in the assembly. It's in your personal prayer closet. Now in the assembly, he goes on, verse, picking up with verse 21. It's amazing to me too, he brings up the law since the law has been done away with according to some preachers. And he's bringing it up to Gentiles. In the law, it is written... With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all which uh, that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore, tongues are a sign not for them that believe, but for them that believe not. So in an assembly, and I've been in an assembly where you had people from many different languages, and sometimes just unbelievers there. And there would be a tongue and there would be an interpretation. Now, a lot of times what I have found when there are, there are many ethnic groups there, as a sign and a wonder, the person speaking tongues is actually talking in another language they don't understand, but the one that's going to get prophesied to does. Then the interpretation is a perfect interpretation of what they heard in their own language. And it was, it was for the unbeliever. And if there's no unbeliever in the assembly, then tongues and interpretation is not appropriate. It should be direct prophecy. When I was over in Germany, we were in assembly up in, up in uh, Frankfurt. And so we had some Italians there and some Germans there and, and a couple other groups that I can't remember. And we had us GIs. 
And there was a missionary there that had been traveling through that spoke all the languages because he had to in all his missionary journeys. And so you have a private, okay? You know, the basic private from America, his only language, and sometimes they don't even act like it's his first language, is English, okay? Because of all, you know, country, English. And so he gives, he speaks in tongues. Everybody's waiting for interpretation. Another GI gets up and speaks in tongues. Everybody's waiting for the interpretation. Another guy gets up and speaks in tongues. What is this? A guy gives up and gives an interpretation, but it sounds like tongues. Another guy gives up and speaks an interpretation. It sounds like tongues. The missionary gets up and gives an English language interpretation and says, oh, by the way, These first three were giving prophecies. The other two guys gave the interpretation in the other languages of the people representing here. And he said, I know all three languages. And he said it was all perfect. He said, the first one was in tongues. I didn't understand. But he said, the other two or the other four that were given, some of them we thought were interpretation, was a perfect interpretation. He said, once it turned into a language I can understand, he said, every single one of them were verbatim with the proper dialect in the interpretation because, you know, sometimes if you ever see Spanish, sometimes if there's a question, the question is at the beginning of the sentence instead of at the end of the sentence because things are structured differently. So the dialect in the interpretation was perfect by these GIs who didn't know what they were doing. And I mean, there were people weeping and crying and hitting the floor seeking Jesus. That's what's supposed to happen when there's a tongue in interpretation. And it's because God loves those people and he wants them to know that he's real and that he's alive. It was not about building up a ministry or bringing it to the forefront or making any preacher famous. It was about making Jesus real to the people. That's what we need. But look at what he says here. But prophesying serveth not them that do not believe, but them that believe. So when there's prophecy for exhortation, edification, and comfort. It's for the believer because the non-believer will dismiss it. They'll say, Sister so-and-so was up there and just, and just having her say in church and trying to wrap God around it some way or another. Now, I didn't pull it out in the Scriptures, but he also goes on to say, listen, those of you that are prophets, and he says the prophet is, is uh, the spirit of the prophet is subject to, to the prophet. I've actually had prophetic words that God has had me sit on, especially in some place where I, I'm not known. I, now, there's a lot of places I go, they know me. And they say, anytime God gives you anything, go ahead and give it. And I have that liberty. If I don't, God gives me a prophetic word that's more than just exhortation, edification, or comfort. It's actually a prophecy. I will go and I will find who is the spiritual head of that house. And I will say, God has given me a word, and here's a synopsis of it. 99% of the time, I said, well, go ahead and give it. Hey, Brother Lake has a word, go, go give it. And uh, I've actually had one tell me, uh, not this morning, I think that'll be more appropriate tonight. And you know that word set perfectly in my spirit until I could deliver it that night? Because the spirit of a prophet is subject to a prophet. But he also says those that are spiritual, the apostles and prophets that are within the house, need to judge the, the prophecies that are exhortation, edification, and comfort to make sure they're actually of God. Now that one's a hard one to do. And do it in love. Because you have Billy Bob get up and get, I think he's given a prophetic word and what he's doing is He's, he's expressing his own heart's desire, what he wants to see at church, and trying to empower it by a prophetic word. And for a prophet to be able to stand up and say, Billy Bob, I love you, but that wasn't of God. That's a rough road to hoe. But that's the balance the Apostle Paul was bringing here. We have to have that kind of maturity in the body. Let's go on to verses 37 and 40. If any man think himself 
to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge the things that I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. Now those that have problems with the commandments of God don't know that the commandments start in Genesis and go all the way through the book of Revelation. Here, because the natural thing for God to do is to give a commandment. This is the way it should be done. This, because part of the thing of Torah is this is right, this is wrong, this is a me, this is the enemy, this is clean, this is unclean. And that concept flows unhindered unless you try to chop it off artificially. It flows unhindered from cover to cover of your Bible. And so here is the Apostle Paul establishing new commandments from God in the New Testament for us to follow. So he says, Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy, and forbid not the speaking in tongues. And we have had some go to the other side of the house because of immaturity of others, and have forbid speaking in tongues, not knowing its purpose, and have, have quelched the moving of the Holy Spirit. At the same time, I think we have also seen a bunch of people running around speaking in tongues, and the Spirit of God left the house because it wasn't of Him, and it was not done in balance and in order. Whenever a body assembles together, it is never about you. If you are being a vessel that God is using, whether it's praise and worship, whether it is uh, an intercessory prayer doing church, whether it is the message of working at the altar, none of it is about you. It is about those in need that need a touch from God, that need to hear from God, and the only way they can do it is you have got to get out of the way. When you approach the gifts that way, and they are balanced out with the fruit of the Holy Spirit, it brings harmony and strength and edification to the body of Christ, which is what we are needing. And his end instruction is here, let all things be done decently and in order. If it causes confusion, if people do not benefit from it, if they're not touched by God from it, why are we doing it? And there are some things, there are many things today, and Mary and I was listening uh, to True News last night, and they had a woman that wrote a book on the, uh, on the New Age way back in the 80s. And I've, I've got the book here somewhere in the library, I want to dig it out. She was an attorney. So she has an attorney's mind and attorney's research skills that begin researching all this stuff. And she found out how they in, had, had uh, invaded the, the evangelical movement and saw the charismatics as a, as a way of of bringing life to the transformation they wanted to bring into Christianity. And so there are a lot of manifestations today, there are a lot of things today that make the guy famous, that makes his movement famous, that may put his ministry on the map, but it was never of God, it was never for God, it was about, it was about bolstering that ministry and its eye within the community. I would rather nobody know the name of Michael Lake, but they know the word and they glorify Jesus. That's the way every true minister of God, that is their heart is that in the midst of all this, that you would lose sight of us and that you would hear the Spirit of God, that you would glorify Jesus, that you would yield to the kingdom, that you would be empowered to walk with Him, and that God would change your life because if you're left on autopilot, you will destroy your own life unless God intervenes and you stop following the flesh and you start following the Spirit of God. We can't pray enough for you. We can't cast out devils enough for you. There can't be enough money thrown at it because it will never be finished until you're changed and that change can only be done when we lose sight of ourselves and to simply let God have his way whether it's tongues whether it's the gifts of the Holy Spirit whether it's teaching the word whether it's praise and worship intercessory ministry if it ever comes about us Self is the spirit of Antichrist, and it will begin dismantling everything that God wanted to do in that assembly. Only through the crucified self 
that we, have, we are crucified with Christ, yet he is living through us, can we ever accomplish anything truly in his kingdom that's going to be worthwhile? And I think that's part of the balance the Apostle Paul was trying to bring out. You can do all these things, but if it's not love for the Savior and love for the people instead of yourself. Now why are you saying that? Because everybody was going there saying, I speak in tongues. I'm on the high rung of society now. I'm not just a merchant. Rondai Shandai, Rondai Shandai. And their pride was setting them up for Satan to take every one of them for a fall. In fact, that chaos was going on in that assembly. They were fighting over which preacher they followed. I'm of Apollo. Well, I'm of Paul. Well, I'm of this one. I like Timothy. I like that one. Some of them are trying to be more spiritual. Well, I like Christ. At least, at least that one's really good. You know, anybody go, goes on a pedestal, it better be Jesus and Jesus alone. But Paul had to deal with that division. He even went so far that he said there was a guy in your midst that made his father's wife his wife. Now, in the, and I, I need to exegete that more in the Greek, and, and I've read some commentators. I don't know if he was actually made his mother, his wife, or his stepmother. But the Apostle Paul slammed a hammer down and said, listen, I've judged this thing. I've turned his body over to destruction of Satan so that his soul could be saved. And actually, 2 Corinthians is 3 Corinthians. We, we didn't keep 2 Corinthians. By the time you get to 2 Corinthians, which is 3, Paul said, let the guy back in. He's repented. He's gotten right. I mean, it probably scared him to death. What the, okay, you're going to die because I'm going, to save, I'm going to save your soul because if you keep going in this direction, you'll go to hell. That kind of sets something interesting in the once saved, always saved thing. He probably saw that if he kept on that trajectory, he would eventually deny Christ. But if we're going to be the remnant in the last days, we've got to bring things into balance. We're going to have to do it where it's Jesus-centered and not us-centered. Whether we're, we're ministering in church or whether we're living our lives out there, how many know the way that you live your life out there brings the greatest glory to God? The way that a lot of Christians are walking their faith out in the community, it absolutely destroys every word ever preached from their pulpit. I have heard people say, I've seen the way the people live that come from that church. If that's what they're preaching and that's what it does, I don't want any part of it. What they should be saying is, people that go to that church are different. Now, they may go through rough times like I do, but it seems like God brings them out the other end. They got a smile on their face. They, they have a comfort I don't have. They begin having answers I don't have. They can walk through things that I've never thought I could walk through. I want what they have. That's what's supposed to be produced in the community, not by the preacher, but by the people that are listening to what he says. All that can happen when it's Christ in us, our hope of glory. We've crucified self. We bring things into balance, and we're moving in our priesthood the way that God has called us to. Now, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you would just set our hearts to being more like Jesus. Father, let us deny self and follow him. Let us learn to crucify ourselves and our fleshly desires so that the things of your Spirit can flourish in us. Father, let the remnant's hearts be on fire in these last days so that they could attract men caught in darkness by the light of you functioning in their lives, we ask. And we thank you and we praise you for it in Jesus' name.